thank you for having me. My name is Jason. I'm the fishing manager at the uh, Orvis store in Bellevue. Uh, I've been there for about five years now, um, but started my journey with Orvis actually at our Scottsdale store, so I'm an Arizona boy. Um, spent some time in California and uh, honestly had never been to Washington, had never stepped foot in the state uh, until they said, hey, we need a fishing manager at the Bellevue shop. Would you, uh, would you like to come up and work there? And I said, yeah, why not? And I went to the U-Haul and came on up. Um, and very happy that I did because it's, uh, I mean, Washington is, as you know, phenomenal um, from a fishery standpoint. Um, and what I really enjoy about it is just that I can fish every day of the year. So it's, uh, and there's a lot of variety, and I think variety is kind of the spice of life, and I like to do different things, and I think if I just did one thing over and over again, I'd probably get bored with it. So I've done this presentation uh, a couple times before at some other clubs, um, call it 365, which is basically just, you know, fishing throughout the year, and just a little glimpse into, you know, some of the things that I do, some of them I don't necessarily do, but I do ideas for you. Um, a lot of what I've talked about, I'm going to talk about are kind of day trips from Seattle, so some, you know, you can add a little bit of drive time in there. My whole purpose with the, with the, the presentation was to, you know, for, for local fisheries, but a lot of this stuff that I'm going to talk about um, is, is really applicable to the stuff you guys fish. Um, if you have any questions at any point, um, just let me know. This is just like kindergarten, just raise your hand, happy to help um, in any way I can, and uh, if I know the answer, I'll answer it, and if I don't, I'll just, um, I'll make something up that sounds really good. Um, so happy there. Um, but uh, anyway, let's just dive right into it. So, quick public, public service announcement here. Orvis fly rods catch more fish. So, it has been scientifically proven. UC Davis did a study. Um, you can Google it. I actually made my own Wikipedia page for it, so there you go. Um, so yeah, Washington. You can fish 365 days a year, as you all well know, for a variety of species. Um, you know, trout fish or fly fishing is more than just Brad Pitt trout fishing in a river. Um, we have incredible diversity, and there is literally no excuse not to go fishing. Um, a lot of people tell me I don't have time. I work in a shop. I ask everyone. I don't even not doing any fishing. I'm just curious. I don't have any time. There's stuff within, I mean, how far is Lone from where we're standing right now? Like 15 minutes or something? Um, there's a park over here that has beach access that's like seven minutes away. I don't know, I think, I think the whole time thing kind of a, a load of horse hockey, but that's just me. Um, quick note on regulations. Obviously, always check before you go. Um, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, they have a regulation hotline and email um, if you have any questions. Uh, if you have any questions fly fishing related, maybe life related, you know, I'm here to help. I'm here to, I'm cheaper than a therapist, the guy in the fly shop. Um, but any, uh, any questions on regulations, don't call me. Um, I'm, I'm borderline Ill illiterate and uh, haven't read the book, so call the people that know. Um, this is just kind of a season breakdown of the different species that you can target. Um, throughout the course of the year, uh, you know, trout, trout's definitely a year-round thing um, in Washington, which is nice, and then we have things like steelhead, salmon, um, tiger muskie, carp, bass, uh, all that fun stuff. Um, so a lot, of, uh, a lot of different options for you. Kind of how I have this presentation structured, I'm going to, I wasn't sure when I put this together exactly how I was going to do it. Um, so basically, I'm going to start off by the season, but as I get to each fishery, I'm just going to run through all the seasons on that fishery. I felt like that was the easiest because, you know, I could talk about the Yakima four times throughout, or I could just talk about it once. And so I thought that was the most practical. Um, if you don't think so, I'm sorry. Um, OP Steelhead. So for me, it's a long day trip, but I mean, I live in North Bend, so it's a very long day trip for me. Um, but you guys can hop a ferry and be out on the peninsula pretty quick, um, relatively quick, I guess. Um, but in the wintertime, that's awesome. There, I mean, winter, January, February, March, I don't think there's a better place to fish in North America in March than the Olympic Peninsula for winter steelhead. So awesome, awesome option. There is uh, pretty good walk and wait access out there on a few different rivers. Um, always something going on, always a lot of fun. So I do enjoy doing that in the, uh, in the winter time. Um, Rocky Ford Spring Creek is another one of my winter, winter favorites. Um, it's a spring creek, so it's pretty consistent from a water temperature standpoint. Um, for you guys, it's an exceptionally long day trip, so I would probably stay at the Best Western there in Ephrata. 
um, and, and make a two-dayer out of it. Um, but the nice thing is, there's ginormous fish in there, um, and they eat flies, and it's a lot of fun. It can get a little crowded on the weekends, but if you go there with that expectation, it's just fine, okay? So if you think you're going to go there and be the only one, you're going to be sorely disappointed. But if you realize that there's going to be 20, 30 other people there, if not more, everyone's there to have a good time. We're all there for the same reason. Um, you during, know, during the summer, it really gets silky, or you can't. It gets it. real weedy. You get your fly in the water. Hard. So it, I, I fished it um, about. Ball, too. Yeah, I fished it about two weeks ago. And um, it, honestly, it wasn't really by choice. It was just because we got so blown out in Montana that we just came back and had to know what a fish felt like, so we stopped there. But mid-April is probably about the latest I yeah. fish it. Um, it can still fish kind of well, um, you know, into the early summer and stuff. But it just gets a little too ticky for my li liking. Um, you know, there's rattlesnakes and stuff um, too. I'm an Arizona boy. That doesn't necessarily bother me so much. Rarely are rattlesnake bites fatal. So there's your fun fact of the day. It's like less than two percent. Um, but uh, but yeah, I'm definitely more of a more of a winter guy there. So, it's kind so of winter, a December, January, February. Generally, they talk. So you're talking about dry flies. You can get dry fly fishing, um, but a lot of what you're going to do is going to be indicator fishing. Indicator fishing. Yeah, okay. yeah, just a small New Zealand strike indicator, a couple um, small midge patterns, guts, that sort of stuff. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. and a lot of small flies. Okay. Um, the nice thing is access on Rocky Ford is really straightforward. You can walk around the whole thing. Um, you actually can't wade there. It's the rules, so no wading. Um, but you wouldn't want to. It's a spring creek. You'd sink up to your earlobes in, uh, in mud. Uh, another good option in the wintertime, Sea and Cuddy fishing. You guys certainly know about that being on Whitby. Um, Puget Sound never blows out like the rivers do, so always an option. Um, but it does blow. It does blow. That's, <laughs> that's fair. That is fair. Um, you don't need too many flies. I mean, honestly, if you had a dozen, two dozen flies, you'd have everything you need for a day of sea run fishing. Lots of public access. Fishing and moving tides always, always kind of optimal. Um, but just, I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of miles of, uh, of access around Puget Sound. Five or six weight, um, floating line or cold water intermediate. Um, if you are going to fish an intermediate line, that stripping basket in the upper right hand corner there, that's kind of essential just from a line management standpoint. That way as you strip, your line doesn't sink down your feet. Um, and then stripping guards, just something to cover your finger because you're going to be stripping all day. And if you cut your finger in fresh water, it's not always the biggest deal, but when you do it in salt water, it's, just, it's got that little added bit of sting that's, that's not necessarily all that much fun. Um, and then 0 to 3x nylon or fluorocarbon. Um, I've found that the Sirens don't seem to be too leader shy. Le Leland, um, who, who some of you might know that works at the shop, he's uh, um, been fishing sea runs since Jesus was a baby, and uh, he uses zero X. So if zero X is good enough for Leland, well, I, 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 I'm, a, I'm going. I'm going pretty heavy. Zero X. It, ends, it equates to being like 16 pound. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So yeah. Big, yeah. It's big. yeah. He doesn't mess around. Get a, a salmon too. Yeah. You never know. You know. Ne yeah. It's true. At certain times of year, you never know when you're going to hook into something a little bit bigger yeah. out there. He, yeah. He's got some favorite spots. He does. I know Daryl's. Mm -hmm. I've seen him down at the Narrows mm -hmm. when I first Yeah, he lives in Canada, so he fishes a lot of South Sound stuff. Uh -huh, yep, yep, yep. Um, and these are just a list of some different places. Um, what did you say the sea run cut through? It's, uh, well, it's year-round. It's open year-round. Um, and mean, you can fish them year-round. The presence of the, of the fish. They're around all the time. Yeah, so in the, for in the saltwater stuff, the South Sound is better um, in the winter because there's there's fewer major river systems that they're going to go up to and to spawn because they're they're spring spawners. Um, so places like up here in the middle of January might not be awesome, but you'll still find some fish kind of picky poking around. Um, and then through the summer and the fall is an awesome time to fish for them. But the thing is that a lot of times they get overshadowed because you know it's salmon season and guys will go salmon fishing instead of going chasing sea runs. But um, we've had days where you know, you go to no point, and you know you catch a couple salmon, or you don't, and then there's enough other beaches out there around over there. Like you just pop right down to Eglon, and there's no one there. Everyone's lined up on no point, and you just knock out sea runs the whole time. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, and then another great winter option. <laughs> Believe. Come on, come with me to the beach. Get out of the rain. <laughs> catch some bonefish, catch some tarpon, catch some yeah, kermit, get a tan. Nice it's easy to get to. Everyone flies to Blee City. Southwest flies to Blee City, okay? 
Um, and it's relatively inexpensive. Um, we do a trip that's 2700 bucks. It's three days fishing, four nights lodging, all your meals are included, all your local alcohol, and they will over-serve. I, I know that from experience. And, uh, and we give you a free H3 rod, so you get a $900 fly rod with the trip. So, pretty good deal. Um, let me know, we'll get you going. Uh, a few winter thoughts, just dress warm. Always carry a second set of clothes. That, uh, that could save, uh, save your bacon. Um, as far as gloves go, um, anything fingerless, but my thing is I carry like four pairs of gloves with me when I'm fishing in the wintertime. One gets wet, I put a new dry pair on. Hand warmers, I have an, an electric hand warmer like the quarterbacks wear, it's the best investment I've ever made. A little small towel, no such thing as bad weather, just bad gear. Um, and with that being said, sometimes it is better just to sit at home, tie some flies, yeah. think about fishing, drink some bourbon, <laughs> um, it's just kind of hang out. It's good to stay warm when you're an Arizona boy, as you said, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's true. It's true. I don't believe it. What, what's funny is, for, for me, so I absolutely I hate the heat. I don't know how I survived Arizona. I don't complain all winter long about the rain. I love it. It's still a novelty. Yeah. But as soon as it hits like 80, because we don't have AC in the house, I save all my complaining for something. <laughs> you can't complain about both. It's got to be one or the other. I'm a firm believer in that. Um, as far as local lakes go, so there's, uh, well, from our store in Bellevue, there's over 50 lakes within an hour. There's nearly 8,000 lakes in Washington. A lot of these are stocked. Um, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, so this is a picture of their website. If you guys haven't used the Department of Fish and Wildlife website as a resource, you're missing out. Um, they have an entire section on lowland lakes, on uh, high elevation lakes. They have a ton of like water access points on there for all the rivers and stuff. They put out their weekender report, which is just something at the beginning of the month to tell you what's going on. Um, but you can pull up a map of lakes by county. So this is just a little glimpse of King County. Um, and you click on one of those lakes and it pulls up another view. It tells you what type of fish are in there, best time of year to fish for them, launch ramps, rest area, that sort of stuff. They have a stocking schedule. But this thing is absolutely clutch for finding new different places to go. And I think if you get on, if you get on their website, I think you might, be, you might end up being pretty surprised how many lakes there are um, nearby. Um, essentials for still water fishing, some type of watercraft, whether it's a float tube, rowboat, anything, that's probably the most important. Um, and then just having a variety of lines floating, intermediate, type 3, type, um, type 5 or 6. Um, if I was to have two, two lines for lake fishing personally, it would be a floating and a type 3. Because I feel like anything I, can, I need an intermediate for, I can generally get away with a floating line and just kind of an intermediate, um, an intermediate tip. When it comes to fishing different lines, um, I'm a firm believer in just getting extra rods. So have a line, a rod rigged up for your floating line, have a rod rigged up for your type three, your, your intermediate. And that way, if you want to fish different levels of the water column, you don't have to take a spool off, re-rig everything, do all that jazz. You just pick up another rod and, uh, and go fishing. Um, and that, that's something I even do when I'm you know, fishing rivers for trout. I mean, even if I'm doing a walk and wade, I have two rods with me, sometimes three, um, just because I don't want to retie. You know, we do have limited time to go fishing, and I want to maximize my time on the water. Um, and quite frankly, I'm lazy. If, if I have a nymph rig on and I see fish rising, I'm more prone to just throwing the nymph rig at them. But if I have a dry fly rod set up, um, I can actually fish dry flies. So. All sorts of rods are good. Uh, Stillwater fly selection, um, chromids, calabatus. I have a feeling you guys fish a lot of lakes, um, it sounds like. So I don't know if I'll go too, too deep into that. Um, another great place to go in the spring is the Yakima. So I've caught dry fly fish on the Yakima the last week of February. Mm. Um, March is a great time to be out there. April can be a great time to be out there. Um, you know, you do have to look at flows, you have to look at weather a little bit, but if you get a few warm days in a row, you can go fishing, and the nice thing is you can go fishing bankers hours, so you don't have to be out there at the crack of dawn, you get out there like, I'm on the water at 10 o'clock, that's awesome, I've slept in, had a nice breakfast, and I'll fish like 10 to 3, and then I'll be home, home in time for dinner. Um, so, great place to go, late winter, early spring, um, 
the nice thing about this time of year too is the fish are super kegged up in their in their kind of winter runs. So as the water cools down, the fish's metabolism slows down and they transition to this kind of slow, deep, like walking speed water. And the nice thing about it, that is, is they're all in that spot. You know, where you found one fish, you found like 20 fish. Um, and especially if you're just doing a walk and wave, I mean, this is the time of year that I don't even really feel the need to float because you can walk up to a spot, you can stay at that spot for two hours, and you can catch fish consistently the entire time. You don't have to move around a bunch like you do in the summer. Um, you can get some dry fly fishing, uh, definitely some midges, blue olives earlier, and then March we start seeing the squalas. Later in March, first part of April, we start seeing the March browns. Um, so some good dry fly fishing can be had on the yak that time of year um, as well. Um, switching to the Yakima in the summertime, flows are up, all that water is used for ag. There's no way you're going to, well you, you can do a walk and wade, but I wouldn't recommend it. It's kind of a boat show. Uh, if you do want to wade, just stay up high, basically anything where the Cleolum dumps in. So the um, Easton State Park, um, Bullfrog, there's some accesses there where you can, can do a little bit of wade fishing. Uh, you want to fish pretty tight to the bank. You know, that higher water, it's going to push those fish right to the margins. Um, and this is the time of year you get awesome dry fly fishing. You got goldens, you got caddis, you got PMDs. Um, that hopper fishing starts in the summertime. Um, you get some drakes. It's, it's just good, good fishing all around. And then generally in September, those flows will drop again. You know, the farmers don't need the water anymore. And it goes back to being something that's wader friendly up and down. Um, and you can still get your dry fly fishing in the fall too. So blueing olives, um, mahoganies, and then October caddis. Um, I've had some awesome, awesome days on October caddis uh, in the fall. And it's another good time of year to fish streamers. I think every time of year is a good time to fish streamers, but the fall especially can be very, very, uh, very productive. As far as access goes, so the upper, uh, Easton, like we talked about, which is exit 71, Bullfrog, which is exit 80, and then right there in South Clanalum at, um, at exit 84. And there's good walk and wait access at all of those um, in the spring and the fall. And then you go down to like the lower Yakima, Irene, Reinhardt State Park, which is right in Ellensburg. There's a ton of weight access in there. Uh, Ringer, one of my favorite runs, is just right upstream from the boat launch. Um, Tanum, there's a bazillion pull-offs just along the road there. So if you, if you go over there, you know, I think I feel a lot of people think they have to have a boat to fish the Yakima, but when that thing was running less than 2,000 CFS, you can really, you can really knock it out of the park just doing the walking weights. Yeah. Hmm. Nice thing about walking weights too, especially like in the spring, like you, you and even in the fall, you, you stay at a spot and you don't feel the need to kind of go over the, go go all over the place. Like when you're fishing out of the boat, it's like okay, I rolled like three drifts through this. Let's go mm -hmm. downstream. Mm -hmm. Okay, I put three drifts through this. I gotta go downstream. You're constantly moving around so much. Um, when really, if you just sat in one spot and, and really scrubbed it, you, you'd be more productive. Uh, trout essentials for the yak. You know, base, your basic trout stuff. Um, floating line is going to cover 95% of what you want to do, unless you want to throw streamers. And a sink tip is optimal. Um, you know, three x to five x leaders, and then all the different accessories that that you, that you want. Um, as far as river fishing goes, if you guys are indicator fishing, you guys you probably you know do some indicator fishing. Ten foot five weight. Does anyone here fish a ten foot five weight? Okay, you're welcome. I just changed your life for the better. Okay, <laughs> a ten foot five weight over a nine footer, you would be shocked what that added foot does, just from a mending standpoint oh. and a line management standpoint. So the whole casting, it's not going to get you any more distance. Um, but once that line's on the water, just being able to make your mends is, uh, it's, it's incredible. I, I, I wouldn't go anywhere without a 10 foot five weight. Do you use the, uh, what, a single hand spade cast at all? Um, I, I do actually, yeah. I don't, I don't necessarily think about, think about it. I just, I just do it, but because, you know, if you're fishing a nymph rig, it's downstream, you know, you do a little snap tee and then, and then roll cast it out there. Um, if you want to, do single hand space stuff specifically for like fishing streamers and stuff like that, um, then yeah, it's a great way to get some distance without you know having a lot of room behind you to back cast. The key with that is just having the right line. 
So you got to have a line that's got a pretty short line. head. Yeah, it's going to be pretty stout. And it's going to be a pretty single purpose line. But it's it's going to be your streamer line that you fish out of a boat. It's the streamer line that you'd use if you had some room to back cast. Um, we make it, we, we call it a bank shot. It's got like a 25 foot head. Uh, a Rio, an outbound, um, you know, an outbound short. I think those are in that 25 to 30 foot range. That's another really good line for that. Um, and then these like OPST heads, they're really like you're getting big on that single hand space stuff. Um, stuff oh, I was just thinking off the, off the beach here too. Mm -hmm. That you were. Yeah, you absolutely could. Yeah, you could. Yeah, the, 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 Generally off the beach, I use a lot of shooting headlines anyway, yeah. so those are definitely more conducive to the single hand space stuff. Yeah. Um, Forks of the Snoqualmie. So, not close to you, but 100 yards down the road from me. Um, and a fun place to go for, for you guys if you, if you have a day. Um, ample public access. It's great, um, you know, if you're a newer angler yourself or if you're introducing an angler into the sport just because there's a lot of fish and they're generally pretty willing to eat a dry fly and they're not very discerning. Um, there's absolutely no big fish here and that's not me making this up so you guys don't come fish it. There's just literally not any big fish in there. Um, if you catch like a 12 to 14 inch fish, um, that's going to be your big fish. You know, you're going to catch a lot in that 6 to 10 inch range. Um, but they have big hearts, and that's and that's what matters. Um, the north and the south fork are kind of just smaller streams, and the middle fork fishes more kind of like a, mi a mid-sized river. It, it runs a little bit bigger. Um, in the spring, the water can be really can be pretty high, but the south fork stays pretty clear. It'll it'll go out, but it'll only go out for a day or two, and then it'll come back down and clear up. So if you're looking just somewhere to go fish some moving water, that's a great place to go. Um, and even if it is dirty. Don't shy away from it. I think off-color water, it really, you know, guys think you can't catch fish in it, um, but you can. Um, basically, what's going to happen with that high water, once again, it's just pushing the fish to the margins. They're actually probably going to be easier to find. Um, they're still eating. They still have to eat. Um, and there's, there's an increase of biomass coming down the river. There's more stuff, actually, for them to eat. So you can still fish it when it's a little off color. You just kind of concentrate on the uh, on the on the soft edges. Uh, in the summertime, the flows will drop, and it'll be much much easier to wade, much more manageable. Dry dropper, you'll you'll go out there and catch fish all day. Um, if when you fish in the summertime, do carry a thermometer, and if that water temperature reaches that 68 to 70 degrees, mm -hmm. that's a good time to stop fishing. Um, go to the North Bend Bar and Grill, grab a beer, grab a burger, and just kind of just kind of hang out because it's at that at that point it's just it's bad for the fish. Um, they'll still eat flies and they'll still initially swim away, but what you don't see is 15 minutes later when they go belly up. Um, so yeah, if the water temp's warm, definitely a good time to stop fishing. And then in the fall, once again, just I just keep fishing the forks because I can do it after work. But in the fall, you just want to keep an eye on uh, on the flow levels because as it starts raining more, yeah, you're going to see fluctuating flows um, that can kind of put it out. Um, and if it does get bigger, maybe go with like a double nymph rig or small streamers or something. Not big streamers. You throw something like that. That's the size of the fish you're catching, but just small like butters and stuff. Uh, access. Is awesome. Any exit between 32 and 47, you're going to find access on the South Fork. Um, and then Middle Fork Road is totally 100% paved up to the campground now. Oh, yeah. So it's just it's a straight shot on up, and you're, you're there in like 15, 20 minutes. It's awesome. Um, it's probably going to be more people up there, yeah. but um, my my insides will feel better after I get to the top because that was that thing was potholed and they did. They, they definitely, I don't think they wanted people up there, it was so bad. Well, I mean, people used to dump all their junk up there, too. Yeah. They had a big deal to clean up the top of the middle fork. Yeah, I don't know, I'm sure that's still a thing. I'll tell you what, if once you get past the middle fork um, campground and where the tailor comes in, um, it's not there now, but in the summertime, um, the, the transient camps seem to pop up right along, mm -hmm. right along there. And same thing, high on, uh, like exit 47 on Tinkham Road, um, you know, there's uh, definitely some folk out there that I try to generally kind of avoid. Um, it just looks kind of shady, but if you stay down around like Twin Falls and Owali and stuff, you're totally fine. 
the regs. Um, selective gears are just single barbless. A lot of people don't know that the, all the forks are open year round. Some people think they close, but they're open year round um, to catch and release. But you can, from Memorial Day to October 31st, retain fish. Um, I don't know why you would, but as long as you're within the confines of the law, you can do whatever you want. Um, spring thoughts, uh, check the river flows before venturing out. Look for a couple days of warm weather in a row, and then the fish are stacked up, especially early in the spring. So if you found one, you found like 20 other fish. So stick with that spot. All right, summer. So now I, I just want to talk about how, how you guys can catch big fish like me. Let's, let's, uh, let's move on here. Tip number one, hold the fish close to the camera. <laughs> um, so one of my favorite things to do in the summertime is go small stream fishing. So growing up in Arizona, we actually had a lot of small streams, so I kind of cut my teeth on that. Um, but there is so much water in Washington that nobody talks about. Everyone talks about the forks of the St. Paul. Everyone talks about, yes sir? One summer, we had every stream east of Stevens and Sapphire Pass. And you're right, this, if it's year-round stream, mm -hmm. there's fish. Yep. The thing you have to remember, though, is there's a 14-inch fish in that stream, but nobody's caught it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. If every stream is year-round, you'll find fishing. Yep, yeah, yeah. And they're, and they're all places, like, if you listed off some of those streams, no one here would have heard of them. Well, yeah. the amazing part was that each stream is indigenous to itself. Cause mm -hmm. Some will be dark, some will be light, some yeah. will have strikes, some will have fun. But there's no two streams exactly alike. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, it's kind of interesting how they, you know, their own environments, you know, kind of produce fish that sometimes look a little bit different. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so small streaming. There you go. I mean, there's a guy to start going to for some info. Pump him for info, guys. Where'd he go? Yeah, there's no water in it. There you go. Uh, that's, that sounds like the kind of friends I have. Um, <laughs> So the thing you, you, you need to, to go find a place that no one's heard of, you just need a map, the fishing rigs, my computer, with a, you know, you can get the internet and go to Google Maps, uh, a very small box of flies, a three-weight, and just a little sense of adventure, and you also need to be okay with not catching any fish, because you know, you're going to have days where you go, to, you know, you go scope out some spots and, you know, maybe there's no water, maybe there's water, but there's not always water. 357 helps, too. What's that? A 357 helps. A 357 is always, it's always good to pack a little heat. You know, why not? Absolutely. Especially when you're off in those areas. Mm -hmm. Yep. yep. Um, so a good thing to do, so let's say you want to find a spot that no one else is at or, or not too many people go to. So you just look at a map. We have something like the Yakima River. We have a stream that runs into the Yakima River. Well, if that stream runs year round, I can pretty much guarantee there's trout in it. Mm -hmm. That's applicable with any river. Now, you take that a step further, um, you look at the fishing regulations. It lists off all these little different creeks that no one's ever heard of, and it's, you know, there's a reason it's in the regulations. It's because someone at some point has fished it. Um, so you take that information, you go on the, uh, the Google webs, you pull up a satellite view, and you can do some pretty, pretty instant recon. You find the road that's next to it, how far you have to walk. If you get some topo, you can make sure that you're not, you know, oh, it's only a quarter mile. Well, it's also <laughs> 600 feet change in elevation. <laughs> so, you know, you can get some pretty pretty basic ideas. Um, and then just go, you know, put in the legwork and, and go fish it. Um, and honestly, Google Maps is something that I use all the time, especially when I'm going somewhere new. So we went up to Albert, or, uh, from, um, BC and Alberta this last summer, go fish the elk and, um, mm -hmm. You know, go over to Alberta, fish the crow's nest, the old man living, and all this stuff. I knew I had a folder of printouts of where I wanted to park and where I wanted to fish before I even got there. Because um, I could see, I could park here, there's a bend there, that's going to be good. You know, a lot of times when you go to new spots, you waste so much time, just windshield time, driving around. But if you have those ideas already, you're going to be in much, much better shape. Well, so, so, sure. Just really quick. We, um, I had some friends that hiked into the Old Man River, mm -hmm. which is a great river mm -hmm. in, in Alberta. Mm -hmm. And uh, they hiked in over a hill, mm -hmm. and the next day we were all going to go there because they had spotted a great spot. Mm -hmm. A couple of them wanted to drift it, and we were going to do it. Well, we hiked in, and, and sure enough, this was a lock gate, and this was a ranch, and there was no getting in. Mm -hmm. Except one of the guys was happened to be a hunter. 
And he says, well, he's the oldest guy in the group. So the old man went in to talk to the rancher. Mm -hmm. They gave him the keys to the ranch, yeah. mm -hmm. whichever gate you wanted to use, go ahead. That's awesome. Yeah, and um, it turned out to be an that's rad. That's yeah. super rad. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't hurt to ask. That yeah. just goes to show. And the ranch he walks into is, you know, your vision of what a ranch is, this is like a complex with multiple um, multiple uh, equipment sheds, barns, mm -hmm. uh, garages, mm -hmm. homes, uh, uh, places for the ranch hands to sleep, mm -hmm. parking lots, the whole thing. And he just walked, we all stayed away. Go ahead, Larry. Yeah. That's <laughs> it was a great day. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Was someone else going to say something? I was going to say, sometimes you'll, you'll see some people will post actually a GPS location on, for example, if you're hiking or, mm -hmm. you know, we've, we've camped at different places and they'll uh, boondock, mm -hmm. the boondock camping sometimes you go out and we want to find a place out in the, you know, off the beaten path and a lot of times people that have been there have, will post the GPS site on there and just plug in the GPS will take you right to that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you do that with you're able to do that with some of your fishing experience. You can. But probably something yeah. you can do is marking those, yeah. those, those spots. Yeah, yeah, you absolutely can. Yeah. That could be a good book. Yep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm not getting I'm not yeah. GPS no, my no. spots. <laughs> <laughs> no, you absolutely can. I mean you can plug a GPS cord yeah. into Google Maps and it'll 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 pop it right to it. Um <laughs> I have some techie friends that um you know, you post pictures on the internet or watching them fly fishing or whatever. Oh, yeah. If you don't have it turned off in your phone where that picture was taken at, you can right click on, on the image and they, they have a way to download the image, put really? it in there, and get the GPS. Really? Yeah. You know? <laughs> so pe people a lot smarter than me have, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. have scrubbed Washington fly fishing and made a map of where all the pictures were taken. Really? Yeah. Oh. Um, yeah. So sometimes that's a real techie. That's post. a real techie. <laughs> that's, they're very techie. Yeah. Um, other stuff I like to do, growing up in Arizona, I was, did yeah. a lot of bass fishing. Um, and uh, there's a lot of local lakes around here that have warm water species as well. So, you know, as that trout fishing maybe starts to taper off in some of these lakes, the bass fishing is going to start picking up. Um, something very key with bass is going to be, just like with trout, it's going to be water temperature. So if you find water temperature in that 65 to 75 degree range, that's awesome. You're going to find fish in 10 feet or less, and that's very targetable with a, uh, with a fly rod. If it's colder than that, if it's hotter than that, I don't think it's really going to get hotter than that on the west side of the state. Um, you know, it can be a little bit tougher, but that 65 to 75 is great. Um, and after you catch a fish, bass are, get so um, congregated on spots. So just make a mental note of that, because where you've caught one fish, you're going to catch more. So if you notice it's on, you know, it's on a rocky bank, and you catch fish, 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 you get to, you know, where there's a bunch of reeds, and all of a sudden it turns off. Well, just you know, keep kicking, get to the next rocky bank, and and fish that, and you're gonna you're gonna find more fish there. Uh, and also, your fly can't be too big for bass, so never think it is. Um, a bass will eat a third of its body weight, so think of that: a three-pound fish will eat something that's a pound. Um, it's funny. So growing up in Arizona, I did a lot of conventional bass fishing and tournaments, and um, you know, the stuff that the small stuff that we threw with gear rods. Um, is like blows people's minds when you show them at, at a fly shop. You, know, you show someone a fly that's like that big, and they're like, "Oh my God, how am I going to throw that?" That's that's right massive. Right and I'm like, "That's rods, <laughs> man." Yeah, yeah. I call that fly cute. Like, I gave my cousin who was a bass fisherman with a very large, very large sculpted pattern because mm -hmm. I had tied it. It was really a bad tie, I, I would say. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he won a tournament, a bass tournament. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Um, bass gear, so once again, some type of boat, um, six to eight weight rods, and a lot of times when you're throwing those heavy rods, it's not because of the fish size, especially in Washington, it's more because of the size flies you're yeah. throwing. It just makes it easier to throw that kind of big gnarly stuff. Um, you know, poppers, bait fish patterns, crawfish patterns, um, bass will eat, uh, pretty much anything that will that'll fit in their mouth. Just think about what type of forage is in the lake that you're fishing. You know, if there's perch, Fish some perch patterns, you know, there's probably going to be bluegill fish and bluegill patterns, um, different types of bait fish, all that fun stuff. Um, there's next. a question here. Yeah. Just, yeah. Yes, sir. Just a comment. Sure. We did the John Day a couple of yeah. times. The third day, you try to figure out what people won't take. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's true. Yeah. Small, the smallies there, I have, I, I have not done it, but I've heard they are uh, pretty voracious. Oh, pretty big, too. 
Do they get big on the drum in? Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. That's good. I like catching big fish. Um, next thing we have is the cedar. So that opens in June. It's super close to our shop. I mean, it's 20, 30 minutes away. It's just right down in rent. Um, there's actually some pretty big rainbows in the cedar. Um, so one of the guys that works at the shop, he's got a buddy that works for, I don't know if it's WDFW or some, um, you know, some department that does the, does fish surveys. And they've, um, they've surveyed fish over 26 inches on the cedar. I mean, there are massive fish. Um, it's it, it blows my mind. Was, it, was that a river that was closed for a while? It was closed yeah. for a while. Okay. Yep, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, and it's only a three month season now. Yeah. Um, and then there's this presentation was from last year. I don't know if that's going to be applicable. There was a uh, time um, parts of the river that were closed to doing walk and wades uh -huh. because of log jams, so uh -huh. you couldn't actually get in the water. Basically, it was closed because you have all the people doing the booze cruise going down the river on tubes. Yeah, a couple of couple um, of drownings over there. I yep. guess summertime drownings. Yep. Uh -huh. Yep, so just they just basically, from a liability standpoint, and I don't blame King County yeah, for it, right, um, right. they just said no one gets the fish. Um, other thing we have, and for you guys I guess it's pretty darn close, is the Skycomish. So it does get summer steelhead. Keep in mind the summer steelhead are hatchery fish, so I'd be kind of concentrating up around Reeder. Um, there are various access locations along it. Um, if I'm just going to go fish the sky, if you're just doing a walking wade and you're targeting hatchery fish, Big Eddie or, or, or Reeder Ponds, you can walk downstream from Reeder and get away from all the yahoos. Uh -huh. um, stay off the tracks. You will get a ticket if they if they see you, and I think it's pretty hefty. Um, just walk in the tracks? Yes, absolutely. You cross it. You, I, that may be true, I don't know, but um, I, there was a period there maybe two years ago where they were getting pretty heavy handed with the tickets. Um, I, I, think they, I, I think they hit someone with a train, um, which here, here's my tip of the day guys, you see a train coming at you, take one, take one step to your left or right, you'll be fine. <laughs> Well, they get right confused. <laughs> yeah. Actually, right? 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 Yeah. Okay. Maybe I'll run away from it. Getting <laughs> territorial. This is coming from a and, and two, this is coming from a guy that thought it was a good idea to walk through a train tunnel that was pretty long, but it was easier than going around the mountain. And there was a train coming into the tunnel within ten seconds of me exiting. So yeah, it's. Uh, but they have little cutouts. You know, it's, I would have been fine. It would have been loud, but I would have been fine. Um. So another cool place, especially for you guys being up here, so if I were you, I wouldn't even mess around with the Forks of the Snoqualmie. Go to the Forks of the Skycomish. So they fish basically the same, if not better, and you have the Beckler, the Tye, the Foss, the Miller, you have all these tributaries that go into them. There's, I think, five or six rivers, streams, whatever you want to call them, within 20 minutes of the town of Skycomish. Um, they all have trout in them, and there's actually some pretty decent sized trout in the forks and then in some of these tributaries too. Um, definitely a lot bigger fish that are in the forks of the Snoqualmie. Um, the South Forks, de pretty decent sized river um, and um, you know there are steelhead, they truck excess steelhead up there. I wouldn't necessarily target steelhead there but it's you can certainly um, get them as a bycatch. Um, I'll talk to like 10 people a day going to the forks of the Snoqualmie during the summertime. I'll talk to maybe one person a week going to the forks of the sky. It might just be geographically where I'm located. You know, if I worked at Pacific, it might be a different story. But um, just uh, just an idea. Um, if you do want to venture to the east side, do some small stream fishing relatively close. The Tianaway um, is always pretty, uh, pretty consistent um, and the forks of the Tianaway. The North Fork generally has the most water later in the summer. Same thing, real basic selection of flies, um, and once again, if that water gets gets too warm, good time to stop fishing. Um, you have, as far as access goes, you have the North Fork Road, the Middle Fork, the West Fork, so, you know, access is pretty darn good on it. There is a, a pretty fair amount of private property, so just be respectful of that, um, and you will be in good shape. Also fun in the summertime, Puget Sound Coho. Obviously, very close for you guys. I mean, 10, 15 minutes away. Um, starts. I have August there, but it, you know, you can start catching fish in July, um, pretty, uh, pretty easily. Catch salmon right off the beach. It's cool to bring home some fish. You know, box some hatchery fish. Be the provider. It's a good feeling. Um, eight weight, intermediate line, box of clousers. That's all you need for that. Um, there's some fun beaches to go to. Um, I, I, well, I guess I've fished up around the pass for Coho and Whitby, but I 
I'm sure you guys know some good spots that I don't. Um, summer thoughts, so many options, so little time. Early part of the season, definitely keep an eye on flows. I mean, a lot of these places, when they open in June, they're going to be blown out. You're not going to be able to, to, to fish them very easily. Um, if you go salmon fishing, it's going to be you and 100 of your closest friends. Keep that expectation. We're all out there to have a good time. Um, and you'll be good. Watch the water temperatures. Um, you know, find some solitude if you want, using a map and the fishing rigs. And uh, if you're gainfully employed, cut that nonsense out and go, uh, go fishing. If, you, if you're ever thinking about quitting your job, don't do it in January. Uh, fall, last but not least, chum salmon. So we'll start seeing those in November. It's a fun way to catch some pretty big fish on the fly rod. Um, somehow chum salmon season just it, it, it can on occasion bring out the dregs of humanity. Um, <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if you guys have been to Minter Creek during peak, the, the yeah. peak chum run. Um, it's interesting. It's kind of it's okay just to sit there and watch sometimes. Um, as far as gearing up for chum, eight weight is an absolute minimum. Uh, if you want to chase them with your six weight. Go, go for it. That's kind of like four-wheeling in a Honda Civic. Yeah, it's fun for like two minutes and then something I guarantee will break. That was um, one of those gadget, and the guy was walking back to his car with his nice bamboo rod mm -hmm. with little pieces. Oh yeah. And he was pulling out another one from the quiver. <laughs> oh man, that's, a, that's not a cheap break either. <laughs> Um, other uh, line, floating, we'll cover most of your bases. A lot of times it's a real slow strip on the chum, so sometimes even with an intermediate, you can get too deep. So floating, maybe throw an intermediate tip on there. Um, and other than that, you don't need a whole heck of a lot, and uh, I just use 16 pound on the, uh, on the tippet. Um, something else that's close for you guys, and I've only done this occasionally, but the times I have done it, it's been pretty fun. Um, in the fall, and that's going to the Skagit and the Sock for bull trout. Mm -hmm. um, so you can swing streamers, white, bull trout love white, but have a variety of mm -hmm. colors with you. Um, and it's a good way to kind of just brush up on your tuning in the game, you know, before winter steelhead season. Mm -hmm. You can take a light spay rod out there. Um, plus, you never know what you might run into. And then if you do see, um, you know, there's going to be chum in the river, if they're dropping row, basically, you just take the run behind that, wherever that, you know, that is, and then you just fish egg patterns or, or beads, um, and yeah, you might catch an early uh, winter steelhead, but I, I think it's, I've only done it a couple times just because for me the drive is, there's so many other options as opposed to driving and dealing with traffic, but um, for you guys, that's something, if I lived, lived on Whitby, I'd be doing that. Yeah, the bull trout get fairly sizable. Yeah, they're like a seven, eight now. Yeah, there's some oh, big I've ones seen in there. One up to eleven pounds. Wow. Yeah, really? Just to mention to this group, there's a there's a there's there's a, a town called Hamilton, which is which is near low low part of the river, mm -hmm. and there's a state park just upriver of the Hamilton. Beautiful park. Yeah, it's gorgeous, and it's and it's a, all of that that whole zone area. Mm -hmm. And Hamilton, there's a boat launch area. The state park is a walk down. Um, but it's bull trout or steelhead and salmon. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, definitely. And there's camping in the winter. Right? <laughs> yeah. Camping in the winter? I don't know about that. That is a <laughs> <laughs> the bull <laughs> trout. Not for the faint of heart. Yeah, the bull trout. Electricity and everything. Oh, really? Oh, oh nice. nice. So, Jason, the reason they're not stocking a steelhead now in the sketch is because of the bull trout. Okay. They found out the bull trout were eating about 50 to 60 percent of the. The, uh, not salmon, but the steelhead. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I believe that. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. That's I stopped stocking right. steelheads out of there. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, when I um when I lived in Arizona and, and a lot in California too, this happens in the wintertime when they stock a lot of the reservoirs with with trout, and it's basically just bass food. Um, you know, guys will catch certainly go places and catch trout, but um, it's it's pretty crazy to see. Uh, a pod of bass that are in that six to ten pound range, busting you know twelve inch trout like you would see you know, other fish just busting right. big fish. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's pretty gnarly. So it doesn't surprise me about the bull trout. And um, I, don't, I don't know if anyone else has had this experience. You know, maybe I've, I've had a couple times fishing in Montana where you'll be hooked up on a little you know a little cutty or I a little I probably a 10, 12 inch whitefish on once, just bring <laughs> it in and you know. 
a fish that was well over 26, 28 inches. I mean, this is one of the bigger fish I've ever seen. Um, trout wise, just comes up and just annihilates this yeah. whitey. Oh, 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 oh. It was just, it's, it was so cool. And that's why I, I love throwing streamers, so I love seeing that stuff. Yeah. Um, my closing thoughts for you guys treat every fish as if it, your survival depended on its survival. So um, keep, them, keep them in the water, keep them wet, use barbless hooks. A lot of places it's the law, but in general it's just good for the fish and, uh, and your thumb when you happen to put an air hook in there too. Um, play nice with others. We're all out there to have a good time. Um, I don't know why. Sometimes, sometimes people just get cold on the river and, and, and it blows my mind. You know, you walk past someone and Everyone's looking down, hiding yeah, their yeah. flies, looking at you, thinking a parachute atoms is a big secret. Um, but, uh, but we're all out there to have fun. Um, it amazed, so this last trip to Canada really kind of, it, it amazed me because everyone I talked to up there, I mean, one guy was, was about to give me the GPS coordinates to like wow. his favorite fishing yeah. spot and like this is what we're using and there's just so much interaction. And I think it's just because there's, there's fewer people on these rivers, so it's it's just that's that's easier to do. You don't feel like you're getting crowded out. But um, yeah, you know, if you're not having luck, say hey, what do you, you see? Someone whacking a bunch of fish, just ask them. And, you know, start yeah, a conversation. Right. Everyone, you know, people will talk. Everyone has it. That's more good time. fiction because when I first started fishing on Vancouver Island, mm -hmm. you had a hard time finding a sporting goods store with fly fishing and stuff. Mm -hmm. And nobody fished about the high tide line. Because mm -hmm. everything about the high tide line is catch and release. Mm -hmm. And I can remember going to the spot about 2 o'clock, couldn't leave until about 3.30, so I had my 12 fish. Mm -hmm. but there's just nobody fishes there. Yeah. Oh. Huh. yeah. Especially fly fishing. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you what, the, the whole. Canada, for going up to Alberta and going up to Fernie, it's definitely replaced one of my Montana trips for the year. I mean, hands down. Yeah. I can be in Fernie just as quick, yeah. actually quicker than I can be on the Missouri. Um, and the fishing is awesome and there's there's less people. I mean, we went up and floated the elk on a Sunday. And I think there was like two other boats yeah. like on the elk on the stretch. It's beautiful. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty neat. You it's, might it's also good. do that in Fernie. There's there's countless number of rivers up there too. There is. Yeah. I mean, the, the only problem that it's kind of that they've they've put up made all those class two rivers, so you got to get the licenses. So oh. Basically, the day they come out, or you ain't fishing them. Oh. Um, so like uh, Michelle Creek, the Wigwam, oh, um, yeah. a lot of those big name ones. You can't just go fish. You got to oh, we book your day to. way in advance. Yeah. Um, or go with an outfitter because they have rod days. Um, the Wigwam but, has an enormous uh, bullfrog. Yep. You, Yep. I have I truly have a picture of that big one. Yeah, I believe it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they're in there. Yeah, I'm excited to go back up this year. You know, Jason, I got I know you've covered most of the our trips mm -hmm. away from Seattle. Mm -hmm. But do you have any uh, comments on some of the eastern lakes that uh, uh, either some of your some of your fishermen come in and fish regularly, such, mm -hmm. such as the Chewbaccas and the Blue mm -hmm. Lakes and I don't know if you have any I don't special know. lakes or if you've not no. really. Um, to, to be 100% honest yes. with you, I'm not a big lake guy. Okay. Um, I do maybe like one trout trip a year, still water fishing, um, just to remind myself I'm, I just, yeah, I just yeah, don't yeah. like so, doing it. Yeah, I, I love fishing right. bass in lakes, yeah, yeah. Um, but I just, and I, to yeah. be honest, I really wish I could get into trout fishing in yeah. lakes. And I'm sure I'll get there at some point. I just, it's yeah. just not my thing now. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I mean, I, I like rivers a lot better. Mm -hmm. uh, but as, you know, actually we've got a trip coming up in, at Japaka where you all fish in Chipaka, but a couple of guys that I fished with uh, planning this year again in a couple of weeks are going to get over there. But mm -hmm. I'm with you. I mean, I like the I like the rivers. I mm -hmm. like the small mm -hmm. streams, big streams. Mm -hmm. um, last couple of closing thoughts: fish when you can, no excuses. And I always put put um, our good buddy Einstein up there. Um, the definition of an insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And so often I see anglers, you know, sitting in one spot or, you know, using the same fly all day. You know, I've had this fly on for the last four hours and I haven't caught anything. <laughs> if you leave that fly on, I'm not, I'm not Miss Cleo, you know, despite the striking resemblance. But um, you're probably not going to, you're still not going to catch any fish. So if you... You know, a big part of fly fishing, I think, is confidence. So if you're not confident that the fly you have tied on is going to catch a fish, then I'd probably cut it off. 
Um, and if you don't think you're going to catch any fish, I'd probably just go home because you're not going to have any fun. Um, so just just vary it up. Um, you know, I could leave a fly on for two casts and cut it off. I could leave it on for an hour and before I cut it off. Um, but just start mixing stuff up. You know, whether that's your fly selection, which I think a lot of people turn to. Um, more importantly, maybe your presentation, the type of water you're fishing, all that stuff goes into it. And then when you catch a fish, you know, like we talked about earlier, just make that mental note and think, you know, where did this fish eat? What type of water did they come off of? Because a lot of times fish are going to end up congregating in kind of the same kind of areas. I'm yeah. afraid that theory goes out the door when you're fishing for steelhead off the beach. That's off the, <laughs> off the beach, yes, yeah. Steelhead off the beach is, uh, yeah, you, you have to be a, a real glutton for punishment for, for that. But, um, um, but yeah, I, I, is that, have, you, have you caught a few steelhead off the beach? or? Lots. Lots? Good. That's awesome. Yeah, that's something I've always, I've heard about, but I haven't, I haven't really felt like putting the time in. Particularly um, when you see them hit. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Because you see the act when it's clear. The other day, I saw this one hit. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Do you fish, any, do you fish so, in any top water for them? You know, I'm kind of fishing top water. I'm, okay. I use a sinking line with a, I use a, I use a small hoochie. Okay. That's what I really use. Yeah. What it, what it sure. boils down to is yeah. a tube fly with. Mm -hmm. And it does surface, and it'll skate across the surface, and then I'll give it a big yank. Mm -hmm. And then I'll give it a second one. Mm -hmm. And that, and it's sure. And that's where I'll catch it. That's awesome. And they hit it. That's awesome. That's it. You know. And how many minutes out your front door is doing that? Ten. Yeah, that's pretty. That's, that's stellar. <laughs> that's special. That's really cool. Yeah, I can only imagine. Catch them and steal it in the salt. They I hate, hate you. You, <laughs> <laughs> you might take you. you might if you talk to them nice, you might take them. You have access. Yeah. <laughs> and the other, two weeks ago, one guy had nine fish on and landed seven above the breakwater. Yeah. There's been a lot of fish over there being taken. I live over in a place called Magoon Point. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I take my dog down there walking. And I'll see a lot of gear guys down there, and you know, they're plunkers. Yeah, they're plunkers. But uh, you know, last couple of weeks, I guess it's they're still going down there. But this last three, four weeks, you know, four or five fish, it was not uncommon. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know, right along the beach, right wow. on the beach, they just travel a lot the beach. Of yep. Half your summer. Hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. I might come back up and fish. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Well, that's about all I have to say about that. Um, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Any questions or anything? or? No, well, just come on over and fish. We'll, we'll get you a place to stay. Hey, any one of us will put you up for a night, maybe. Cool. No problem. I like that. You know? yeah, Who's the best cook? <laughs> 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 your, you your couch is where I'll be. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Jason. Cool, yeah, thank y'all. I appreciate yeah, it. Uh, we've actually had Lee on over several times. Oh, good. We did, uh, went down to South Libby Park with him and fished on the beach. We did a fishing cool. thing, and he's done some of his popper stuff. Mm -hmm. Stuff for us. And yeah, has, Fort Casey, too. yeah, he's done the Fort Casey. I saw the, uh, the the main trail to down to the beach washed out over there. Yeah, but they're supposed Are to they be doing it? it. Okay, cool, good. Yeah. This is where? Um, the, at the South at Libby. South Libby. Um, at the little state park. Oh, right yeah, there. State yeah. Park, yeah. And yeah. We, my wife and I just signed up to help with the parks things. They're oh, getting cool. volunteers to come in and help do stuff. Cool. And they're not going to use volunteers for that, but they said they are going to fix the trail. Good, cool. Mm -hmm. and maybe they can fix it. Sounds it. like a lot like manual. Maybe they can actually fix it. I don't know what you want to volunteer for. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hopefully. Not a clue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll stay away from that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, thanks again, guys. I think I'm, uh, I'm going to go for the ferry.